Welcome to the Turkey Hunter Podcast with me, your host, Andy Galliano. In this podcast, I share with turkey hunters just like you how to have more turkeys on your hunting property and how to have more successful turkey hunts. I teach you how to do this with tips and interviews with turkey hunting pros, wildlife management tips, and entertaining turkey hunting stories. Tune in weekly as I share proven and simple strategies to help you have more success this turkey season. Make sure to head over to www.iamturkeyhunting.com to subscribe to receive free turkey hunting tips, tactics, strategies, and product reviews. Also, please visit and like my Facebook fan page. Go to Facebook and search I Am Turkey Hunting. And also feel free to post your turkey hunting photos from this past season and let us know where and when you killed your bird. For all of you Twitter users out there, please follow me on Twitter where my handle is at turkeyhitman and I will be sure to follow you back. And now, for this week's show. Hello and welcome back to this week's episode of the Turkey Hunter Podcast. You are listening to episode 103, Miriam's Wild Turkeys with Scott Larrick. And I am your host and the guy who just hit it big. Oh yes, I did. So what I'm talking about is today I received an email from Dr. Bob Owenu. And Dr. Bob has sent me an email from the United Bank for Africa, or UBA. And it appears, according to Dr. Bob, that my email address has been identified by the Nigerian government as being an email address that has been scammed. And that the United Nations has ordered the Nigerian government to award me five million United States dollars with immediate effect and that this money is going to be delivered through diplomatic courier service hand delivery. So the money is going to be delivered to my home address through United Nation diplomatic courier agent and it's cash. I've got nothing to lose here. I have hit the jackpot. So that gets me even more excited knowing that we are 153 days, 12 hours, 0 minutes, and 5 seconds away from opening day of turkey season. And what I plan on doing with my 5 million United States dollars this turkey season is I plan on turkey hunting all day, every day. And I'm going to hunt each day in a different state. I'd be crazy not to do it. Now, despite this great thing that's going on in my life right now in getting this $5 million award from the Nigerian government, I am now less than 16 hours away from the deadline on that huge project that I was telling you guys about last week. And man, am I ready for life to get back to normal again, if there is such a thing as a normal life for me. So the deadline is here. And I'm not quite comfortable saying that I am comfortable with the project yet. Tomorrow we'll be here soon enough, and I will find out how things turn out in less than 24 hours. Today, though, I have a podcast to do, and we are covering one of my favorite topics. Well, that's turkeys. But we're covering one of my favorite kind of turkeys, and that's the Merriam's wild turkey. And if you're new to turkey hunting and you don't know the differences between the Merriam's wild turkeys and the other subspecies, then we're going to cover that. But you really owe it to yourself to go on to Google and search Merriam's wild turkeys. It's M-E-R-R-I-A-M-S. So go search that and look at some images of the Merriam's wild turkeys. So our guest today on the show is Scott Larrick who is a regional biologist with the NWTF. And Scott and I are talking about the Merriam's wild turkeys' travel patterns, because they travel a good bit, their talkative nature, and the sheer beauty of the animal and the land that they live in. So without further ado, here is Scott Larrick. I hope you enjoy the interview, and I will see you guys on the other side. Hey everybody, I am glad to tell you that I have on the line with me today Scott Larrick with the NWTF, and Scott is a regional biologist, and I'll let him tell us what areas he's a regional biologist for, but I've got Scott on the show today to talk to us about the wild turkey species that is tied in first place as my favorite with four other finishers. And that is the Merriam's wild turkey. And 
they really are one of my favorites. The birds are just absolutely gorgeous, and they are a ton of fun to hunt, and they are in some of the most beautiful country that you could ever hunt any kind of critter in. And so I'm excited to get into the show today. Scott, how are you, and where are you? I'm doing great this morning, Andy. I am in southern New Mexico, right at the foothill of the Sacramento Mountains. Very nice. That sounds like Miriam's country to me. I can be in Miriam's country in 15 minutes from my house. Yeah, see, that makes me a little jealous. <laughs> Another thing that makes me jealous is when you and I spoke last week about doing the interview, you mentioned to me that you and your wife were headed out for an elk hunt. And so tell us a little bit about that before we jump into the show. Oh, well, we uh, got a friend that has a place up in northeastern New Mexico. And so instead of hunting up 20 miles from home, we drive 250 miles from home. But he allows us to come up there and, and help him remove some of those pesky critters that are eating all this grass. And she was she took a beautiful shot at 240 yards, dropped a big old cow Saturday morning, and then the work began. But yeah. she had the habit of dropping these elk about 25, 30 feet from a road. So <laughs> better elk hunter than I am. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, we that reminds me of the first time I went to Africa. I went with my dad and my oldest brother, and my oldest brother and I hunted together for the full 11 days that we hunted and we shot the same animals. So he would shoot a kudu, I would shoot a kudu, he shot a zebra, I shot a zebra. And, you know, so we were basically shooting the exact same animals the whole hunt. Every animal that he shot had to be packed out. (laughs) Every animal I shot was either on the road or within about 50 yards of the road. So it sounds like I've got your wife's luck, which is luck I'll take any day of the week. You bet. Yeah. So good deal. Well, I've given just a bare bones intro, as you know, but tell us a little bit more about yourself and tell us how you got into turkey hunting as well. Well, I'm originally from South Texas and decided in my 20s I needed to go to college, so I started my college career, ended up getting a bachelor's degree from a small school in East Texas that you may have heard of called Texas A&M. I've heard a little something about it. Yeah, one of the finest universities around and a great wildlife program, and I I've been a professional wildlife biologist for the last, oh gosh, over 20 years now, almost 25 years. I've spent most of my life, uh, my career in, in the southwestern United States. My turkey hunting didn't really kick off seriously until I went to work for the NWTF 11 years ago. But I do have vivid memories of my uncle calling up a gobbler for me when I was about 15. And the thing wouldn't come across the creek for us. You know, I'm talking about a creek. I'm one, one you could almost step across. But yeah. you know the gobblers always like to hang up. And with the hair on the back of my neck stood up, and it was quite an experience. And that was on a price that my grandfather had purchased in the late 40s. And he loved to hunt turkeys, but there was no turkeys on it till the 70s. And uh, I don't believe he, he probably never saw a turkey on the property before he passed. But that's the history of turkeys in the United States. There's, there's a lot of people still to this day that grew up never seeing turkeys, that now their children and grandchildren see turkeys all the time. So. Very true. Yeah, and now I, I do hunt turkeys every year now. I don't hunt much fall turkeys, usually just because I'm busy. But springtime, you always find at least a couple of days to go out and chase those gobblers. Man, that's great. So you're, the bird that your uncle called in for you was a Rio? It was a Rio. East. Okay, all right. Yeah, so you not were... so awful far from San Antonio okay. in South, South Texas. So. Okay, very cool. And that's that's exciting. Yeah, I'll, I'll remember that till I till I can't think anymore. <laughs> Our first run-ins with turkeys seem to stick with us, don't they? They sure do. Yeah, they, they got some sort of a special power, I'm, I'm convinced. <laughs> Thunder well, chicken, can't beat them. Man, they're a lot of fun, no doubt. Well, I started doing this segment that I call the Rapid Fire Q&A, and what I do is I put a stopwatch to the people who want to play along with the with the new segment. I'll put a stopwatch to them and ask them 30 questions about really kind of their personal preferences when it comes to turkey hunting, more so than the science or tactics with turkey hunting, that kind of thing. But what it does is it gives the listeners a chance to get to know the guest a little bit better and probably some questions that you've not been asked or that you might be asked sitting around a campfire in camp one evening. And All right. If you're game to play along, we'll do this. Let's do it. Okay. Let me get the stopwatch up here. And by the way, while I'm getting the stopwatch up, just to give you something to to shoot for, the fastest time on this so far 
is Jeremy McCarty with two minutes and 11.26 seconds. And he absolutely flew through these questions. <laughs> so we, we've had the record broken several times. I will not tell you what my time was on this because, well, I'm just not going to tell you. <laughs> I don't like to lose. <laughs> I'll just put it like that. <laughs> Uh, all right, so I'm going to start the clock when I start the first question, and we'll rip through these just as quick as you can go. All right. And by the way, pass is an acceptable answer, but if you pass on every question, I'm going to hit the oh, buzzer enough. on you. Yeah, yeah. All right. How many full-body turkey mounts do you own? Zero. How many turkeys did you kill last year? Zero. Diaphragm, box, pot and peg, or wing bone? Box and pe uh, pot. Wild turkey grilled, baked, or fried? Grilled. Wild turkey, on the rocks, neat, with cola or with water? Maker's mark. <laughs> Number of grand slams? Zero. Make of your shotgun? Mossberg, 500. Make of your favorite turkey shotgun shell? Winchester. Have you ever killed a bearded hen? No. Have you ever killed a jake? Yes. A 10-minute successful hunt on a 2-year-old bird or a 4-hour long hunt on a 4-year-old bird with a queen miss? <laughs> the first one. All right. Favorite camo pattern? ASAP. Wild turkey legs for dinner or for the dog? Dinner. More or less than five strikers in your turkey vest? Less. 30 mile per hour winds blowing at home the last day of turkey season. Are you hunting or sleeping in? Sleeping in. The state you killed your first turkey in? Texas. State you killed your last turkey in? Arizona Goulds. Sit in a blind for four hours and squeeze the trigger or run and gun for one hour and not shoot? Run and gun. All right. You can pass on these if you want. Rios or Osceola's? Rios. Rios or Easterns? Rios. Rios or Merriams? Merriams. Public land out west or private land in the southeast? Out west. Two and three quarter inch, three inch, or three and a half inch shells? Threes. Four, five, six, or blended? Five. Number five. Fields, fields turkeys or woods turkeys? Woods. All right. You answered this on pump or automatic? Pump. Shotgun scope, rifle sight, holographic sight, or beads? Beads. Rubber boots, leather boots, or snake boots? Leather boots. You risked a bird this afternoon, and it's pouring rain at daylight. Do you hunt? I don't. Favorite place you've ever hunted? Arizona. All right. We have two minutes and 32.58 seconds, which is very respectable. <laughs> so just to give you an idea, for a while, Rob Keck held the record at two minutes, 33.58 seconds. So you beat Rob by one second flat. How about that? Yeah. And there's only, let's see here, one, two... Three, four, five. Yeah, there's about six or seven people that are faster than you. <laughs> well, Actually, it's all I take that back. Put that to good thing. Yeah, there's about five who are faster than you, and I will tell you that there are about 20 who are faster than me. <laughs> <laughs> I did miserably on it, and I wrote the questions. <laughs> Those are pretty pretty easy questions, I thought. They are. They are. All right. Well, I've got more questions for you. So let's talk and some Miriams. That's great because I can answer any question that's ever asked, and sometimes it's the correct answer. Well, yeah, you know, they don't necessarily have to be correct. We're just looking yeah. for answers, so that's good. Yeah, I'm good. At <laughs> All right. So, you know, I think in order to talk about the Miriams, probably the first thing that we have to do is talk about the obvious differences. And the obvious differences are the physical differences. And so tell us what it is that makes the Merriam subspecies its own unique subspecies of wild turkey. Merriams are just gorgeous birds. Those gobblers fan up like that, and it's a sight to see. And the most obvious characteristic that pretty much everybody recognizes immediately is their, the terminal band on their tail, that those white-tipped feathers. And I have seen some Merriams where that tip is just pure as the driven snow and others that it looks a little bit more like a real and there's a lot of variation in that it's not often truly white that's goose turkeys have that truly white terminal band on their tail but it's often called a pinkish buff if that's a makes sense pinkish buff it's um it's pretty white but there's a little bit of buff in there mm -hmm. even on their tail coverts those those long tails those feathers on their rump they cover the base of the tail. Those are white tips also. I'll say white. Gives that bird a very distinctive look. Those old eastern gobblers are so uh, distinguished looking with that chestnut brown. And you see some of those, those of those eastern birds, they almost just look like they're all one color. But it's pretty hard to find the Merriams that look so one color because of all that white on their tail. And they often have a very much darker 
almost black body. Yeah. And a lot of gobblers are dark, but that's really what sets them apart. And, of course, where they're found. Right. Yeah. Yeah, they absolutely are beautiful birds. And is there any rhyme or reason? And I, I know the obvious, or at least in my mind, the obvious answer is we're all different and every animal is different. But is there any rhyme or reason as to why some birds are more white than buff? When in talking about the Merriams, is that anything to do geographically speaking, or is it just, hey, Andy, you know, you're olive skinned and not everybody has the same skin color or hair color or that kind of thing? You know, I, to me, from my way of thinking, you've explained it perfectly. Not everyone is as devilishly handsome as you and I, and why do we expect our birds to all look the same? We often see blue jays or, or morning doves or, you know, take your pick, whatever birds you see on a regular basis, and they always look, each species, they always look identical. But if you had them in your hand, you would recognize that there are variations of how they look. Even those blue jays you see all over the southeast, individuals have different characteristics. And turkeys are the same way. We just have them in our hand more often, I think, is what we deal with. So we expect them all to look the same, but they don't. And I have not figured out any geographic variation of this. And through the last 80 years, we have moved turkeys all over this country, all over different states, uh, state agencies and NWTF. And one of the results of that is in some places, we've kind of muddied the waters. Yeah, Anybody that's been in the Black Hills, the South Dakota, Wyoming area, has seen those Merriam's turkeys up there that were transplanted, oh, I guess, what, from the 30s, I believe? I forget. And from what I know, those birds came from northeastern New Mexico in Raton, Cimarron area. And those birds are pretty darn white on their tails. And as, as a result of that, that's what you see in the Black Hills. Down here where I'm at in the Sacramento Mountains, I call our birds the Sacramento Mountain Merriams because they do look a lot different often. I had a friend killed a bird about two years ago and he sent me a picture of it. It's not even 30 miles from my house. It looks like an eastern. And it's like, what is going on here? In the Sacramento Mountains, that's a little different. I think we do have some some genetic issues going on there with maybe some barnyard birds in the past. Who knows? There's no telling. But Merriam's, there's, I think if you look at Easterns and Rios, you'll actually see some variations too, but it's just not as, de, as defining as you'll see in, in Merriam's because we expect that white tail, and we just don't always get it. Yeah. Well, that was my experience on my very first Merriam's hunt. There were four of us on the trip. I think three of us killed birds, and there were pretty distinct differences in the whiteness of the, of the tips of the tail fan. And, and one of the guys killed a bird that was just absolutely snow white, I mean, to the point to where I'm sitting here looking at one of my goulds right now, and it, it was not much different than the goulds that I'm looking at. It was just unbelievably white, and mine was a little bit more of that buff. It wasn't like a pure snow white. So. Right. But, yeah. Where were you yeah. hunting? We were in northwest Nebraska. Oh yeah, yep. So those birds, yeah. those birds are um, Merriams, but like I said, they they look a little different sometimes. Yeah, yeah. You know, at least in my experience of hunting Merriams, and I've I've killed I don't know seven or eight Merriams so far. In my experience of hunting them, they one of one of the main things that I've noticed being a big difference between a Merriams and an Eastern is that a Merriam's doesn't seem to have a problem traveling to come to a call. I can think back to one of the hunts that I was on in Wyoming, and my hunting buddy and I, Brian, heard this turkey gobble just as far as you could hear a turkey gobble. And he continued to gobble the whole way into us. And in a matter of 15 minutes, he's standing right in front of us, looking around like, all right, where are you? I came all this distance, and where are you? And you shot him. <laughs> well, Brian missed him. <laughs> but but that's a different story altogether. <laughs> right, right. Brian, Brian and I, I think sometimes we, we are forced to hunt together because we will miss a bird, but, uh, you know, that's that's part of hunting. But you couldn't, you can't get an eastern to come a half a mile to a call. I mean, it just it just doesn't happen. Right. Why do you think it is? What is your opinion as to why a Merriam's is happy, seems very happy to travel such a great distance to a call? Well, I think there's a lot of reasons it could be given, and I've been thinking about this, and I often think about when I'm trying to get one to come to me, and they never do come to me, which happened to me last year. When you look at these mountain ranges where most of these Merriam's live, if you don't really look at them critically, you might think they're just full of 
resources everywhere. Mm -hmm. But in re reality, it's a pretty tough place to make a living. So they have to range pretty widely in their daily life just to find everything they need. So I think they're used to moving around. Plus they're in often, I don't know much about Easterns, but I've seen groups of Rio Grandes in Texas of two, 300 birds in a huge flock. And mm -hmm. I think the largest flock of Merriams I've ever seen in, in one area was probably in the range of 35 or 40 birds. And they're just used to covering more country to, to interact with each other and to find resources. And heck, it is pretty country. Why not look around a little bit? Um, <laughs> um, Very true. But it's just, I think it's just a, a lot of those factors that's specific to where they live. I've had them hang up and never want to leave the canyon they're in. I've had them show up in places that you hadn't seen turkeys for, for th two weeks, and then all of a sudden they're here, and, and I've seen them disappear. They travel. They're just travelers. And unfortunately, they can go up and down those hills a lot faster than I can. But I think that's what it comes down to, the fact that they're just they're just used to traveling a long way to get what they need, Yeah, including a little Let's bit of love. Yeah, yeah. That'll make us all travel, won't it? You bet. <laughs> Let's talk about the Merriam's traveling because they not only will they travel to come to a call, but they travel a great deal just throughout the year. And so traveling up and down mountains and, you know, over a, a wide expanse of land. But what I really want to kind of talk about, I guess, is talk about their travel patterns a little bit so that we fall and spring turkey hunters might know where to start looking for birds when we start our preseason scouting. So let's let's tackle fall first. Where would a hunter start looking for Merriam's turkeys in the fall? Because it's going to be much different than where we would find Merriam's turkeys in the dead of winter, isn't it? I believe so, yes. Starting in the fall, I believe they're trying to, just like everything else going into winter in the West, they're trying to get as much food as they can, fatten up, if you will. They're looking for acorns, any kind of good mast, any leftover insects, green vegetation around water. In those riparian areas, they're they're looking for those things in abundance, getting ready for winter, just like the rest of us. Right. All right. So I think that's probably pretty much the case with with every animal. You know, they're they know winter's coming and they know that they have to prepare for it in order to survive it. So is there? And this is such a, I guess a, a broad question because Merriams are generally found in more mountainous areas, but there's a difference in the mountains in southern or excuse me in northern south dakota and the rocky mountains in colorado and new mexico but is there generally you know as far as the elevation range any any where that we would start looking for turkeys for merriams in the falls in the fall you know that just reminds me i really didn't answer your question last time <laughs> They're, they're going to be in areas with those food sources, which are typically in canyon bottoms. And they're going to okay. probably be working their way slowly, depending on the size of the mountain range they're in. They're going to be working their way slowly downhill uh, at some point. Although, bless their hearts, they can just pitch off a ridge and fly to the bottom if they need to. Like, yeah. But you're right. Some of those, those ridges in the Black Hills are not nothing compared to what you'll find in the Colorado Rockies. What they're going to yeah. do is I think they're going to hang out probably as high as they can until they're forced down by snow or food conditions or lack of food. And you think about it, there's a lot of critters out there trying to find acorns or what have you, squirrels, pigeons, turkeys, grouse, humans, whatever. Lots of people out collecting pine, pinion pine nuts right now. So turkeys are going to be, I think, in, mostly in canyon bottoms and working um, south-facing slopes where they can find a little bit more green vegetation. And if snow falls, they're going to start moving downhill and, and in reverse of what they'll do in the spring where they'll follow the snow line up, they'll follow the snow line down if it's a significant snowfall, uh, which we don't often get till wintertime, but can happen, of course. So. Right, right. I would always look at any drainages that have a little water in them, a creek or whatnot, um, areas around ponds that, that hold stands of oak, choke cherry, some some species of juniper, uh, pine nuts are a good source of food too. And anywhere they can still find grasshoppers, I think they'll be be happy in those areas. Okay. All right. How about the spring? I mean, you you gave us a I think a pretty good tip, and that is as the snow starts to come down the mountains, the turkeys are trying to get out of the snow and find an easy food source. And in the spring is the opposite that they're going to follow the snow line back up into the mountains. So is that pretty much it. I mean, as far as spring, we just need to kind of look for 
where the snow line may be, or what what is it in the spring that the birds are looking for? Well, if you're in an area that does have a definitive snow line where that snow is melting at a little bit higher elevation every day, that's where I will, that's where I start at the snow line. Okay. And, um, you'll often find those birds right there at the edge of the snow, and there's flowers and green vegetation showing up right there as that snow melts, and dandelion seed flowers, what have you, and that's what they're looking for. If you hunt in areas that are, you know, the Sacramento Mountains near near where I live, there's lots of ups and downs in that mountain range. You can you can wear yourself out going up and down those hills. But generally speaking, it's about the same elevation once you get on top. So you don't have a big dramatic snow line as you will say in northern New Mexico or in Colorado where those mountains are more uh, definitive. So you kind of find your snow line, and it may be. Um, at the canyon bottom on the north-facing slope, but it may be halfway up the slope on the south-facing slope uh, because those aspects of north, south, east, west make a large difference um, to everything out here. The ecology, the whole whole region is driven by whether you're on a north-facing slope or a south-facing slope, and turkeys take advantage of that. And so snow is a good, a good thought. Then if you hunt an area that maybe the snow has been gone or never came, you have to worry about other items such as where those hens want to eat find food because it doesn't matter what the the gobblers are trying to find for food because they, they don't care they're they're looking for hens so you have to figure out what the hens are looking for right okay because i don't live out in that terrain i've never even thought about the fact that the difference in a north facing slope and a south facing slope and the snow line and all of that that's very interesting and it makes complete sense so. the um, north facing slopes are cooler and wetter through the summer then you get less direct sunlight, so there's more trees on them. If you move to the south-facing slopes, the, the sunlight is more direct angle, and it, they they warm up faster and stay warmer and, and are drier, so there's less trees and sometimes no trees on the south-facing slopes. And then east and west is not as, as dramatic as north and south often, although it can be. East-facing east slopes more resemble north-facing slopes, and there's there's more vegetation, trees, west-facing slopes, of course, get that direct sunlight in the afternoons every day in the summer, and they heat up and stay hot, and as a result, most of the west-facing slopes are, are even more severe than south-facing slopes sometimes. Yeah, that is very interesting. It's none of that, none of that moss on the north side of the tree kind of stuff out here. You can look at, yeah. you can look at the whole mountainside and tell, you, tell what direction you're looking at. Yeah, that's pretty neat. Something a flat-footed southern boy never thought about. Well, I never did either until I went to college and started learning about ecology. <laughs> then it was pretty obvious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very cool. Yeah, I, that gets me thinking, you know, if, if I was crazy enough to go on one of those survival shows, I don't know that I'd make it if you took me outside of Alabama or Mississippi <laughs> or Georgia. So I mean, I'd, I'd be lost. in those three states. I'd be lost in that flat country. There's no reference point, so. Well, yeah. <laughs> It, it it can get that way, especially at dark. <laughs> oh, yeah. It seems to get dark every day, too. It does, fortunately. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we're this whole conversation is about a wild animal that doesn't talk to us and tell us about its feelings or its thoughts. So, you know, this is all kind of you and me kind of poking at ideas and theories and that kind of thing. But one thing, again, that I've noticed when I've been hunting Merriam's is that Merriam's gobblers seem to be extremely vocal, much more so than compared to an Eastern or a lot of times Osceola's as well in my limited experience with Osceola's. I mean, take last turkey season and the turkey season before that. Each of those two turkey seasons, in the middle of the season, I went two solid weeks without hearing a turkey gobble. Wow. Without hearing an Eastern gobble. And I just, I have... Never hunted Merriam's where there was a day that went by that I did not hear a Merriam's turkey gobble. And they just seem to be very vocal. Do you think there's maybe the fact that they can see so well in the open terrain and they're not as worried about predators, so they're not as worried about being vocal? What what maybe is your thought process on me grasping at straws here for an explanation? <laughs> I think it goes back to density of turkeys. You know, how many are in there? Yeah. And then how large of an area they roam, and they have to let it know, let every all of them know, I'm over here. 
Yeah. And what well, you know, you said you have limited experience with Osceola's. I, I have less with Easterns. But you think that that gobbler may never move more than a mile from where he was hatched his whole life because everything he needs is there. True. Now I'm not. I don't know that that happens, but you can imagine that that could happen. I'm sure it does in some areas. He could he could literally live his life on that 640 acres of, of woodlot and a, a couple fields, and all the hens know that's where that's where he hangs out. And he just has to gobble once or twice to let him know he's still over there. Where these Merriam scouters, they, these Merriam turkeys in general, they move so much, and there's huge drainages and ridge lines in the way that I think they probably just have to advertise that they are there. Um, yeah. I'm still not sure where you're hunting because every time I hunt them out here, they pretty, they shut up pretty quick for me. So I, I think hunting, <laughs> I think hunting pressure also plays a role in that. And what's going on in that group of birds that you can't see, you know, is there just one guy over there gobbling his head off, or is there is there four big old boss gobblers and and twenty hens, and then a, you got a two year old over there that's just trying to make sure everybody knows he's he's a gobbler. Right. So. I think yeah. it goes back to that large home ranges, low densities of birds, wanting to make sure they can be heard. And that makes a lot of sense because you're exactly right. The Easterns, they know that there are areas that they could go to, I'm not going to say any time of day, but they could go to a certain area, a certain field or a certain oak flat or in a creek bottom, and they could spend an hour or two hours loafing there, and another turkey's just going to come walking through. I mean, it, it, there are places where, in the eastern habitat, where turkeys know other turkeys are going to be at some point in time during the day. Right. So they don't have to gobble because they know a girl's going to show up at some point in time. She may not be one that's hot to trot, but a girl's going to show up. Exactly. So that makes a lot of sense. I, I never really thought about it like that, but it, it makes perfectly good sense to me. You know, I, this is easier to say when you're looking at somebody, but because I use my finger as a, an example, but you know they got a brain about the size of a grape, and I can't figure them out. So <laughs> who knows? Well, you're you're right, and I guess for me that's part of the fun. I'm I like to analyze things and study things and try to figure out why things are the way they are and why these turkeys do what they do. And the truth of the matter is. We'll never know. They're not going to tell us. Even if they could talk to us, they wouldn't tell us what they were doing. They wouldn't be wild turkeys anymore. <laughs> right. And I, you know, I just, I think I have not just turkeys, other stuff. I think I have it figured out. And then something happens, you think, well, that wasn't. I don't have a clue what's going on there. So. Yeah. Tell me this. So you hunt a good bit in New Mexico, probably not far from turkey hunt a good bit from not far from the house there, and. You've hunted Merriam's and other places. Where's your favorite place to hunt Merriam's out of the places that you've been and hunted them? Wow. You don't have to give me a tree. Just say... Uh, there's a lot of places I have not hunted in New Mexico yet, just because I travel a lot for my job. And right. if I'm not actually traveling already, I don't like to go travel for, for turkey hunting. Cause I, I can hunt them right here in my backyard. And yeah. and I think of all the places I've hunted them in, in a number of states, I really, I think I like to hunt here at the house, from the house here at home in the Sacramento Mountains because it is so convenient. I can be in Turkey Country in 15 or 20 minutes, but I don't normally hunt that area. I usually, it's about, I can be where I like to hunt in about an hour from my house. And that means driving up the mountain, parking and hiking into where I like to hunt and, you know, setting up within an hour. And sometimes it's less than that. Just depends on, on how I'm feeling, but that's, that's probably my favorite place. Yeah. Good deal. I'm not sure where my favorite place that I've hunted Merriam's is. I, I hunted in Wyoming near Devil's Tower. That's and not, yeah. That was pretty cool. Um, I also hunted, like I said, in northwest Nebraska. And, I mean, I guess for me, because when I come out west, I'm always just fascinated with the terrain and the scenery and the beauty of it all. And even the prairie and the hills that we hunted in north central South Dakota. It's just so different than any other place that I've been. The thought of having to look at that day in, day out would get kind of boring and monotonous to me. But just to be there for a week or so, you know, the terrain and all that is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, the limited places that I've hunted, Merriam's, I don't know if I have a favorite. They're just all, the terrain is something else. The birds have been very cooperative, so I can't be angry at the birds anywhere that I've hunted. I, I like them all. 
<laughs> right. No, I know exactly what you mean. I, I still remember the first couple of trips I ever made out west and, and seeing the mountains, and it's just, you know, to me it was life-changing. And yeah. to be able to, to live and work in this country that around every corner there's another outstanding view, I'm very lucky about that. And I was in some of the most beautiful country in, in, the, in the North America or last week, and uh, it doesn't get old, but it doesn't – you do view it from a different perspective if you see it often. Right. But I think what helps me is that as a biologist, knowing the names of the plants I'm looking at and I know, knowing the studying geology and, and also in knowing why what I'm looking at, why it looks that way, that, that always interests me. And, and, and maybe seeing a new site, maybe a, a new mountain range or a new canyon I've been in and, and recognizing why – it looks the way it looks and, and what's going on there. And as I was mentioning earlier, the, the north-south slope aspect, you know, looking at all that, to me it gives me a very satisfying perspective of being able to enjoy this country from a different outlook. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of people have been to the Grand Canyon, and it's, a, it's an amazing place, and I never get tired of looking at it. But I imagine if I lived there and worked there every day, there would be times when it's like, yeah, okay, it's just another day, you know. <laughs> so right. whatever, you, you know, whatever you're used to, um, I spent a little bit of time in the Alps in Switzerland, and, and I thought I could just perch myself right there and never have to leave. Uh, that would be okay, but I think I'd get bored pretty quick if there's no turkeys over there. But, uh, <laughs> I'm with uh, you. <laughs> you know, it, it's amazing, though, to, to be able to live and work in this country in the southwestern U.S. I think it's the most beautiful part of the country. Everybody has their favorites. I know some of that stuff in the northwest, and, and the Rockies are pretty amazing, too. But I live in the desert. They're 4,500 feet above sea level, which is dry country. I get a baby on a good year, uh, 12 inches of rain a year, and yet in 20 minutes I can be twice that elevation at 8,600 feet, and snow piles up there all winter, and they probably get 40 inches of rain. And that diversity is incredible. I'm, you know, I can deal with rattlesnakes down here at the bottom, and Merriam's turkeys at the top, and elk, and everything in between. I can look across Tudorosa Basin from the house, 45, 40, 45, 50 miles to a mountain range that's got desert bighorn roaming around it. And uh, in between is the biggest beach in New Mexico with no water, White Sands National Monument. It's it's pretty amazing the all the diversity out here. And I get to work with Gould's turkeys and Merriam's turkeys and a little bit of Rio Grande's. And uh, it's it's quite an interesting place to work. Yeah, yeah. How are the Gould's doing in Arizona? They're doing Good great. Place. They're Good. doing great. We had some big wildfires five years ago that led to a little bit of decline in the population, but Things are starting to recover, and those birds have rebounded greatly. There's more tags this year than ever before, 70, I think, 75 tags in Arizona. New Mexico population of Goulds is, is doing fine. They're never going to be as large as the Arizona population, but we have two tags in New Mexico again this year for the, I think it's the ninth year, eighth year, ninth year, and um, Goulds are doing great. That's good. I didn't know that there were even any tags issued in New Mexico, so that is, uh, I know two is not a lot, but it says something about, the success of the birds and the program to bring them back. Yes. The fact that even one of them is being hunted and, and tagged. So that's an interesting thing. The birds in New Mexico never had to be restored. They were their native population. It's natural and it's small because they just have a limited habitat. If they drew that state line a little bit further east, they wouldn't be in New Mexico. But it's a natural population, and, and it is limited hunt. We we raffle a tag off, and we auction a tag off, and, and that's it. And But that money goes to support the program and, and habitat work down there. And we have brought in some birds from Arizona, but it wasn't necessary to for restoration of the population. They were doing okay. But the Arizona population, I believe in 04, I may be wrong about that, 03 or 04 was the first year they had a tag. One tag, it sold for a like, Somebody told me sixteen thousand dollars at our convention. I think that's right. Yeah. And then here, here we are, ten, twelve, thirteen years later, we have seventy tags, and a probably a conservative estimate of at least twelve hundred Gould's turkeys in Arizona, maybe as many as fifteen hundred. So, yeah, they're doing great, and they're fun to work with. And talk about beautiful country where they live. It is outstanding. Yeah. Yeah. How long did you put in for your tag before you drew? I had twelve bonus points in Arizona when I drew my tag. But you can get more than one point per year because you can apply for spring and fall. So uh, that was probably about five, six years, five, probably four, five years, five or six years of applying. Okay. All right. But I know people have applied for 15 and haven't drawn, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I know guys, I don't know him, but I know of a guy uh, that drew three in a row, a resident. So it's all lucky to draw. That is very true. Yeah. Very and true. I, well, I've... 
I don't have any way to guarantee that you will get a tag, but I do have a way of guaranteeing that you don't, and that is to not apply. Exactly. Yeah. I tell my wife I will never win the lottery because I do not play. Right, right. So, but I, I'd rather take my luck in putting in for a tag in Arizona for spring turkey season, which I just did Sunday night. So hopefully I'll be lucky enough there to, to draw, and I hear my chances are probably just slightly better than winning the lottery. <laughs> No, you know, it's not terrible. I, I know people every year that draw that gold tag, probably because I deal with a lot of turkey hunters. But, but there's, there's, you know, it's not an impossible. It's it's not nearly like trying to draw an antelope tag in New Mexico or Arizona or drawing a bighorn sheep tag. I won't yeah. say it's a chance, but you have a chance. So. Yeah. Well, I put in for Merriam's. Oh, you have even a better draw than that. Yeah. yeah so. It may not happen, but you certainly have a chance. So. I got a chance, but it's just what you said. If you don't apply, you won't draw. Exactly. Okay. So, very cool. Well, I tell you what, I've kept you for longer than I'd planned on, but I've enjoyed our conversation and our talk. And one of these days, hopefully pretty soon, I'm going to call you and pick your brain a little bit on my annual out-of-state trip, which is either going to be Arizona and New Mexico or New Mexico and Colorado, depending on whether or not I draw for Arizona. There you go. I'll be happy to be with you. All right. That'd be awesome. I really appreciate that. But I also greatly appreciate you taking time out of your schedule today because I know you took a little bit of time last week to go on an elk hunt and you are busy today. And I appreciate you taking time out to talk to me about those beautiful Miriam's turkeys and the beautiful terrain that they're in and share some knowledge and a little bit of insight on on where we turkey hunters might be able to find them come hunting season. So that is much appreciated. You bet. My my pleasure. I can do so. And uh, I'll be at Turkey Federation headquarters this week traveling that way. And always fun to be back there where they do have some full body mounts. Yeah, they got one or two, I hear. Yes, they do. It's a great place. <laughs> Will you be at the convention in February? Uh, I have no reason to believe otherwise. I'm always there. Great. Well, then I will hit you up when I get there and maybe you'll let me buy you a, a cold adult beverage. Well, you know, sometimes that happens, so uh, be, be happy to happy to meet you. be great. You'll know by then where you drew that tag in Arizona. That is very true. Yeah. Very true. Good deal. Scott, thank you very much again. And just because I've got you on the phone and you mentioned that you're a grad from Texas A&M, I'm going to give you a roll tide. we got a big game coming up in two weeks, so I wish your team a lot of luck, but not too much. Well, I certainly hope tide rolls over <laughs> Tennessee, and we'll see if, if we can repeat what happened five years ago. I hope it doesn't, but I can certainly <laughs> appreciate your, your view. <laughs> but i tell you, I, I, I may be not the best Aggie in the world. I, I did go there because they had a great wildlife program, and still do, but um, I never went to a football game in three years I was there. And I love when they win, but it doesn't rule my life. So. Mine either. I've still got to get up Monday morning and go to work no matter what happens on Saturday. So. Usually so. <laughs> but it, hopefully I did not get to see the game against Tennessee Saturday because we were – working on that elk and I had no TV or, or only limited radio and no internet service. So I didn't know what happened to the Tennessee A&M game. So it, I wish I could have watched it, but you should try to look up the replay of it. It was a great game. You know, I, I actually recorded it last night off the SDC network and, and watched yeah. the overtime period. Oh, cool. So you saw the, the meat of it then, you know, I, I, and I just, I know what happened. I know the outcome. I just can't sit down and watch the whole game start to finish knowing all that. So I just watched the overtime. It's all good. Cliff's yeah. version works. Yeah, so well, we'll see what happens. Um, I got a deer hunt coming up at the end of the month, trying to kill a mule deer, and, and which has been my nemesis. And uh oh. Anyway, we'll see what we can do. Good deal. Well, I wish you luck on that mule deer hunt, and if you, if you happen to knock one down, definitely email me a picture. I'd love to see it. I'll do my best there. And Andy, I, I appreciate visiting with you, and looking forward to meeting you in February. Yeah, me too. Thank you, Scott. Have a great day. Uh right. bye. Goodbye. Okay, I hope that you guys enjoyed that interview with Scott and learned something that either helps you to kill a Merriam's or maybe it motivates you to plan a trip to Merriam's country to do that. And speaking of planning a trip to Merriam's country, did you know that I can put you on a Merriam's turkey hunt for cheap? That's right. If you'll go to my website, www.diymerriamsturkeyhunt.com. On that site, I have a book for sale, and that book gives you all of the information that you need to book a do-it-yourself Merriam's turkey hunt this coming spring. I tell you where you need to fly into, I tell you where to rent a vehicle from, where to stay, 
where and how to get licenses and maps, what kind of vehicle you need while you're there, and I even tell you where to hunt. The book is loaded with information that you need to plan an out-of-state turkey hunt and go on that hunt and actually have some success. Think of this book as your step-by-step -step guide for killing a Merriam's wild turkey. And you can kill a Merriam's on your own, on public land, and my book shows you everything that you need to know to do it. So go to the website, read a little bit about the book, buy the book. If you don't like the book and don't think it will help you to book a Merriam's turkey hunt, and give you a little bit of confidence that you can go on that hunt and have some success, then I'm going to give you your money back. It's just that easy. All right, so because I've got my deadline tomorrow, that's all that I've got for you guys today. But before I cut you loose for the week, please do me one favor. Please go to iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or whichever podcast player you're listening to this show on and leave a five-star rating and a review for the show. Your feedback on this show is very helpful for others who happen to stumble across this show while they're looking for hunting podcasts. All right. Thank you guys so much for tuning in this week. I know that you have choices. I appreciate you spending your time with us. I hope you have a wonderful week, and I look forward to seeing you again next week. Goodbye. Thanks for tuning in. You were just listening to the Turkey Hunter podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please go on over to iTunes and leave a five-star review. And make sure to head over to www.iamturkeyhunting.com to subscribe for free turkey hunting tips, tactics, strategies, and product reviews to help you have a more successful turkey season. And stay tuned for upcoming episodes on hunting afternoon birds, how to film your hunt, and the breeding cycle of hens, as well as some guest interviews. Thanks again for listening. We know your time is valuable, and we appreciate you sharing some of it with us. See you next week.